Welcome to FAR Module 4, Section 2. This module outlines ruminant nitrogen nutrition. My name is Phil Downsworthy. I'm Professor of Dairy Science at the University of Nottingham. Nitrogen has important implications for the environment. Urea in urine can be converted to ammonia in the air and then that falls in rain and nitrogen uh, will fall on the land and it can interfere with nitrogen sensitive ecosystems. Nitrogen in urine faeces when that's applied to the land as slurry or manure can be converted to nitrous oxide and that's a very potent greenhouse gas with a global warming potential nearly 300 times that of CO2. Also nitrates and nitrites enter watercourses through runoff, through leaching and through soil erosion. And these are particularly important where there are nitrate vulnerable zones, which is about 58% of land in England, 14% in Scotland, 2.5% in Wales and 85% in Northern Ireland. And these areas are really important because there's restrictions on when you can apply manure to the land and what time of year and what time what the weather is like at the, the time of application. The total nitrogen output by UK livestock is about 0.9 million tonnes per year. Of this 23% comes from dairy cows, 13% from beef cows, 25% from young cattle and 23% from sheep and goats. The remaining 16% comes from pigs, broilers and layers. So ruminants play a really important role and they account for quite a large proportion of the, the nitrogen output in the UK. If we look at the, the daily nitrogen input and output for an average dairy cow, then the average cow will eat about 18 kilograms of dry matter per day and that will contain on average 490 grams of nitrogen. She will produce 30 kilos of milk per day and that will contain 150 grams of nitrogen. So if we look at the difference between those numbers then we see that what's coming out the back end of the cow in either urine or faeces is 340 grams of nitrogen and that's 69% of her daily nitrogen intake. So the efficiency of nitrogen utilisation there is 31%. So it looks as though cows aren't very efficient at utilising nitrogen, but obviously they're eating poor quality diets. The amount of nitrogen that's excreted by dairy cows is directly proportional to the amount of crude protein in the diet. So as crude protein increases in the diet, then nitrogen excretion increases as well, and the efficiency of nitrogen utilisation goes down. So when dietary crude protein increases from 13.5 to 19.5%, the nitrogen excretion increases from about 50 grams per day to over 200 grams per day and the efficiency of nitrogen utilisation decreases from about 37% down to 26%. The amount of milk that a cow gives will also affect nitrogen excretion and particularly nitrogen excretion per kilo of, of milk. So higher milk yields will dilute the nitrogen excretion by reducing the proportion of nitrogen that's associated with maintenance. As milk yield increases from 20 to 30 to 40 litres per day, then nitrogen excretion will increase from 200 to 400 grams per day. But the nitrogen excretion per kilo of milk goes down from about 11 grams per kilo of milk to about 9 grams per kilo of milk. So higher milk yields are associated with reduced nitrogen excretion per kilo of product. If we look at it at a farm level, 
Then this was a survey done in the United States of 372 dairy farms. And as milk yield increased, then the efficiency of utilization of nitrogen in the feed increased as well. So at a fat corrected milk yield of 15 litres per day, then the nitrogen efficiency is about 22% when fat corrected milk yield increases to about 40 kilos a day then the efficiency is 34 percent at the farm level. Interestingly also the nitrogen efficiency is related to how well the, the nitrogen requirements of the cows are met. So at the farm level if the nitrogen requirements of the herd are met exactly then in this study the efficiency was about 30%. When nitrogen was supplied above requirements, then nitrogen efficiency progressively decreased to less than 20%. But where cows were fed below their theoretical requirements, then efficiency increased up to a maximum of 35%. In the UK, we estimate protein requirements based on the metabolizable protein system. So a cow will eat crude protein in the diet, and then a proportion of this will be degraded in the rumen, and a proportion will not be degraded in the rumen. So therefore, we have rumen degradable protein, and we have undegradable dietary protein. The rumen degradable protein is utilized by the rumen microbes, providing there's enough fermentable energy in the diet to form microbial crude protein. Some of this will be digestible by the animal. So we look at the digestible microbial true protein and that will provide the animal with metabolizable protein. The undegradable dietary protein portion, some is not digestible and is excreted in the feces. The proportion that is digestible will also contribute to metabolizable protein supply to the animal. Metabolizable protein is used by the animal for maintenance, for maintaining body protein reserves, for secretion of milk protein, and for supporting pregnancy. There will also be some body protein that may be mobilized to support milk protein production. So excess protein is excreted either in the urine or the feces and that is also the route by which um, nitrogen that has been metabolized is excreted as well. The amount of protein that's degraded in the rumen is affected mainly by the, the particular dietary ingredients. And if we look at different ingredients and they have different levels of protein degradability. So some ingredients are degraded very quickly and to a high extent, for example barley, and at the other extreme some ingredients are digested very slowly and to a much lesser extent such as soy pass which is a protected protein source. The rate of degradation is described by a, a degradation equation which includes A, which is the quickly degradable fraction, plus B, which is the slowly degradable fraction, multiplied by 1 minus E to the power of minus CT, where C is the exponential rate of decay of the protein, and T is the time after feeding. So we can see from these curves that different feeds have quite different degradability characteristics. And in the table at the bottom, we show examples of the A, B, and C values for the, the different raw materials. So barley, for instance, has a rapidly soluble fraction of 0.25. The slowly degradable fraction is 0.7, and the rate of degradation is 0.35. Whereas soy pass at the other extreme has a soluble fraction of 0.2. It's potentially degradable fraction is 0.7 but it's only degraded at a rate of 0.02. So 
So what we do is we use these values to calculate the effective rumen degradable protein supply from individual ingredients. So for barley it's 0.77, which means 77% of the, the nitrogen in barley will be degraded in the rumen. For grass silage it's 0.68, for rapeseed 0.59, for soya 0.54. And for soy pass, only 30% of the protein will be degraded in the rumen. So we can use these numbers when we're calculating the degradability of protein in the total diet by combining the, the different supplies of rumen degradable and undegradable protein. The degradability of protein in the rumen depends on a number of factors. Firstly, there's the solubility, which is the A fraction in that equation. Then there are plant factors, such as the physical structure of the plant, which will affect how well the microbes can attack the, the plant cell walls and get at the protein and degrade it. Then there are various processing effects which will affect degradability. For forages, the chop length of the silage will be important. For cereals, it may be rolling or grinding of the, the cereals. And these will affect how well the, the bacteria can get at the, the protein to degrade it. There's heat treatment of protein, which will denature the protein to a certain extent and reduce the rate of degradation. And similar effects can be realized by chemical treatment of proteins to slow down degradability. Then at the animal level, the rate of outflow of rumen fluid will affect degradability. So the faster material passes out of the rumen, the less time there is for the microbes to act on it and degrade the protein. This is also affected by level of feeding. So the higher the level of feeding, the faster the outflow rate from the rumen and the lower the rate of degradation. So this slide illustrates the effects of level of feeding and outflow rate on protein degradability. On the left hand side we illustrate the effect of retention time and degradability. So an animal fed at maintenance level will have an effective degradability of about 0.8 and the retention time will be about 17 hours. At twice maintenance, the effective degradability reduces to about 0.7 and retention time is reduced to about 11. And at three times maintenance, then the outflow rate is 0.6 and the retention time is about eight hours. If we look at the right hand graph then this shows the effect of retention time and degradability on the ratio of effective rumen degradable protein to digestible undegraded protein. So a level of feeding of one which is maintenance level 350 grams per kilogram of protein are rumen degradable and only 50 are undegradable. At twice maintenance, then we have about 270 grams degraded and about 120 grams uh, undegraded. At three times maintenance, we have about 250 grams degraded and 150 grams undegraded. So level of feeding has an important effect on the amount and the rate of degradation of protein in the rumen. When proteins degrade in the rumen, then it goes to form microbial crude protein. But microbes need a supply of not just nitrogen, but also energy. If nitrogen is limiting, then the amount of microbial protein produced will be equal to the amount of effective rumen degradable protein supplied. If energy is limiting, however, then we need to calculate how much energy is actually fermented in the rumen. For growing beef and sheep animals, we use the AFRC 1993 equation, which says that microbial crude protein 
production is 10 grams per megajoule of fermentable metabolizable energy. Fermentable metabolizable energy is the amount of energy digested in the rumen, and it's equal to total metabolizable, metabolizable energy supply minus the amount of metabolizable energy that is accounted for in fat and in silage acids. For dairy cows, we use the feed into milk equations that were published in 2004. And these say that the amount of microbial crude protein produced is equal to 0.625 times the microbial dry matter produced from ATP. Now to calculate the amount of microbial dry matter produced from ATP, there are various complicated equations which are available in the Feed Into Milk publication. For diet formulation, it's important that we calculate microbial crude protein according to whether nitrogen is limiting and according to whether energy is limiting, and we use the lower value from these two calculations. If we look at some typical protein sources in dairy diets and look at the protein and degradability characteristics of those diets, then we can see how different raw materials vary. So grazed grass has a crude protein content of 214 grams per kilogram, and that is degraded at a rate of 72%. So the rumen degradable protein content is 154, undegradable protein is 60. Grass silage has less crude protein in it than grazed grass, but the degradability is about the same. Maize silage has less crude protein again, and the degradability is just slightly lower than grazed grass or grass silage. So if we look at the RDP and UDP contents, then they're mainly affected by the amount of protein in the, the feed, but they're also affected by its degradability rate. We can also calculate the amount of microbial crude protein that might be produced by these feeds. And we see that for grazed grass, the ratio is 1.7 to 1, which means that there's 70% more room in degradable protein available than could be used for manufacturing microbial crude protein according to the fermentable metabolizable energy content of the grass. Grass silage, there's again an excess of rumen degradable protein. It's about 20% higher than would be supported by the fermentable carbohydrates. May silage, on the other hand, has a ratio of RDP to MCP of 0.6, which means that there's only about 60% nitrogen available compared with the amount of fermentable carbohydrates available in May silage. So when we look at the ratio of RDP to MCP for wheat and sugar beet pulp, we find that they're less than one. So for wheat, then it would only supply 80% of the nitrogen uh, that would potentially make microbial crude protein according to the fermentable carbohydrate content. And for sugar beet, it's only 50% of the nitrogen. And then we have three protein sources, uh, soya bean meal, rapeseed meal, and distillers dried grains with solubles. These have much higher protein contents than the other materials considered, and their protein degradability is much lower, mainly due to heat treatment of the protein. So we find that they have both higher room and degradable protein contents, but also considerably higher undegradable protein contents. And when we look at the ratio of RDP to MCP, we see that it's 5.1 for soya meal, 3.4 for rape meal, and 2.6 for distillers grains. So that means there's a, a big excess of rumen degradable protein that we can use to balance out the protein supply from wheat and sugar beet pulp and any other energy supplying ingredients. We can also use these protein sources as undegradable dietary protein sources, which will help to balance the metabolizable su protein supply to the cow. When we're looking at the protein supply to the cow, 
then 50% of its diet is often in the form of forages and particularly with dairy cows that are grazing we need to consider the amount of protein in the grazed grass. Now unfortunately the databases currently in use have a much lower protein content than is found in practice. So for AFRC 1993 they gave six different values for the crude protein content of grass ranging from 97 to 190 grams per kilogram of dry matter according to the season of the year and the stage of maturity of the grass. For feed into milk there was only one value given for the crude protein content of grass and this was 155 grams per kilogram dry matter. In 2014 we published a survey of nearly 9,000 samples of pre-grazed grass between the years 2006 and 2012 and the average crude protein content in this database was 214 grams per kilogram dry matter and the quartile range was from 176 to 250 grams per kilogram dry matter and that accounts for 50% of the, the grass samples. So if you use the feed into milk value or the AFRC values then you're grossly underestimating the, the crude protein content of the grass that's actually eaten by the cow. The reason for the difference is that in the old databases grass would be collected by cutting at ground level so you're measuring the crude protein content of the whole grass. In the modern system then grass is collected by consultants when they're walking fields and they take hands full of grass from the top of the plant which is typical of what the, the cow would be eating rather than looking at the whole plant itself. And the, the growing portion of the grass contains a much higher protein content than the, the stem at the bottom of the grass. Having looked at protein degradability we can now look at how we use that information to formulate diets and in this case we'll be looking at three least cost diets based on grass silage alone, grass silage mixed with maize silage or maize silage alone as the forage sources. The three diets were all designed to meet the metabolizable energy and metabolizable protein requirements for milk yield of a cow yielding 40 litres per day. So in the grass silage diet, as expected, the forage source was grass silage and that was balanced with wheat, rapeseed meal, soya, fat, minerals and vitamins. With the grass silage, maize silage mixture, there were equal proportions of grass silage and maize silage on a dry matter basis and this was balanced with wheat, soya, fat and minerals. And with the maize silage diet, then maize silage was the sole forage source. That was balanced with barley, rapeseed meal, soya, fat, minerals and vitamins. Now if we look at the nutrient and chemical composition of those diets, then we see first of all the three diets had exactly the same metabolizable energy supplies, which is what we formulated for and just about exactly the same metabolizable protein supply as well. But if we look at the starch content of the, the diet, then it increases from 4% in the grass silage diet to 16% in the mixture and 25% in the maize silage diet. This is mainly because of the starch content of maize silage, uh, but also because we increase the amount of wheat in the, the mixture diet. If we look at the total crude protein supply in grams per day, then that reduces from about 4.8 kilos to 4.1 kilos and then 3.4 kilos. And importantly, if we look at the ERDP to MCP ratio, we see that it decreases from 2.07 in the grass silage diet to 1.49 in the mixture and to exactly one in the maize silage diet. And this has important implications for, for nitrogen excretion. 
Fecal nitrogen excretion was similar for the grass silage diet and the mixture, but was increased slightly for the maize silage diet. But this was totally overwhelmed by the urinary nitrogen excretion, which reduced from 424 grams per day in the grass silage diet to 317 grams per day in the mixture and 193 in the maize silage diet. So total nitrogen excretion reduced from 577 to 469 to 357 and nitrogen in efficiency increased from 25% to 30% and then 37%. And this is purely due to the fact that we could balance the ERDP supply with fermentable carbohydrates and get a balance, better balance of microbial crude protein production in the rumen and therefore adjusts the, the metabolizable protein supply with undegradable protein. So overall, comparing the grass silage to the mixture, we reduced nitrogen excretion by 19%. When we compare the grass silage alone with the maize silage alone, we reduced nitrogen excretion by 38%. So this shows the, the range of mitigation that's available to reduce nitrogen excretion in dairy cows. If we look at the starch content of the diet, then that doesn't just affect the rumen degradable protein capture, it also affects milk protein. And starch in the diet actually has a greater effect on milk protein than does dietary crude protein. In this study, which was performed in the United States, uh, where dietary starch contents are much higher, they were comparing three levels of crude protein in the diet with three levels of fiber in the diets as well, so nine diets altogether. And although they were looking mainly at neutral detergent fiber, they were also changing the starch contents of the diet. And we can see that there's a slight increase in milk protein as they moved from 15% crude protein to 17% crude protein but not much change when they move to 18% protein. But within all three protein levels, there was a huge effect of dietary starch content on milk protein production. So dietary starch is important not only for reducing nit nitrogen excretion, but also for increasing milk protein supply. Crude protein though had a greater effect on the nitrogen excretion than did the starch content. So this is the same experiment looking either at crude protein or the starch content of their diets. Dietary crude protein increased fecal nitrogen excretion slightly as it went from 15 to 17 to 18 and it increased urinary nitrogen excretion to a much greater extent. So total excretion went up from about 390 grams per day to over 500 grams per day. The effect of starch was negligible in feces. There was a slight reduction in urinary nitrogen excretion as they increased from 37 to 41 to 46 percent uh, dietary starch. Now those levels of starch are much higher than we would see in the, the UK and but the, the same principles apply. So this study shows a uh, changing dietary protein content in diets that are more applicable in the UK. The idea was that we would look at reducing crude protein content diets from 18% to 15%. So the controlled diet was designed as a typical dairy diet that would contain 18% crude protein. And then we had a low protein diet of 15% protein with the same energy as control. But we were concerned that cows might eat less of the low protein diet. So we also formulated uh, another diet which had low protein, 15%, but with a higher energy content than control. So in the low protein, high energy diet, 
we'd increase the metabolizable energy and we also increase the, the starch content as well. So the, the ingredients were basically in the control diet we had three kilos of soya bean meal and we substituted that for higher levels of wheat, maize grain, sugar beet pulp, soya hulls and a bit of urea and we also increased the, the bypass fat supply in the diet. For the high energy diet we increased the levels of wheat, maize grain, sugar beet pulp, uh, soya and urea and bypass fat further and we reduced the forage supply slightly so as we increased the, the concentrate to forage ratio. Looking at the composition of those diets and the performance of the cows, we see that we achieved the objectives. The control diet had a crude protein content of 179 grams per kilo. The low protein diets both had crude protein content, contents of 150 grams per kilo. The metabolizable energy contents were 11.9 for the, the same energy diets and increased to 12.2 for the high energy diet. The starch content increased from 156 grams per kilo for the control diet to 172 for the low protein same energy diet and up to 230 for the low protein high energy diet. When we look at performance of cows, then we've got a slight drop in dry matter intake with the low protein diets, but this was not significant. We've got a slight drop in milk yield from 42.8 to 41.3 when we fed the low protein diet with the same energy. But with the low protein diet with the high energy, then the milk yield was virtually the same as it was for control. Milk fat yield was not different between treatments. It increased slightly uh, with the low protein diets, but that was not significant. And also milk protein yield was not affected. It decreased slightly for the low protein diet with the same energy as control, but was exactly the same for the low protein high energy as for the control. When we looked at milk urea content, then it reduced from 10.9 mega milligrams per deciliter in the control to 6.3 in the low protein same energy and 5.7 in the high energy. And nitrogen efficiency in terms of grams of milk nitrogen excreted per gram of nitrogen intake increased from 31.3% on control to 36% with the low protein same energy and 37.2 for the low protein high energy. So the conclusion is that by reducing crude protein content to 15%, we only reduce milk yield slightly, but we increase nitrogen efficiency significantly, especially with the high starch diet. Now in that study, we've measured milk urea and milk urea nitrogen equilibrates with blood urea nitrogen. So we can use that as a measure of the overall nitrogen excess in the, the body of the cow. And this graph shows that there's a very strong relationship with blood urea nitrogen and milk urea nitrogen. On the left hand axis, milk urea nitrogen is reported in milligrams of nitrogen per deciliter of milk. On the right hand axis, milk urea nitrogen is reported as millimole concentration. Now, milk urea nitrogen can also be used as an indicator of potential urinary losses of nitrogen. On the left hand side, we see daily urinary loss as ammonia nitrogen, and this is the black bars. So, as milk urea nitrogen increases, then the amount of ammonia that's potentially produced from nitrogen increases uh, from 90 to 180 when mercury nitrogen goes up from 10 to 16. 
On the right hand side, it's the amount of urinary nitrogen that's likely to be lost as nitrous oxide, which is the powerful greenhouse gas. And that increases from just over three to just over six grams per kg per day. Crew protein level of the diet is not only affecting nitrogen excretion, it can also affect the fertility of the cows. Particularly high crew protein diets can reduce fertility. In a review of 21 studies containing 32 comparisons of protein concentrations, Lee et al. found that crude protein affected fertility. They found that either higher crude protein concentrations in the diet or diets with more degradable crude protein reduced conception rate of cows. And the relative risk of conception was 0.91 with these high protein or high degradable diets. And that means that cows were 9% less likely to conceive when they were fed the higher protein levels or the more degradable diets. So that's another reason for reducing the crude protein content of diets because then you will increase the fertility of the cows. Looking at beef production systems, then the same principles apply as apply for dairy cows. So the level of protein will affect the total nitrogen excretion and starch content of diets will affect the capture of rumen degradable protein in the rumen. We can see this by comparing two systems, which was done in a report for DEFRA by ADAS where they looked at grass silage based diets and cereal beef production systems. Now within these systems then protein content and starch content and fermentable carbohydrate content would all affect nitrogen excretion but they modelled the average effects of the whole system and we can see how they affect nitrogen excretion. There's obviously big differences between beef production from grass silage and from cereal beef. But if we go through the, the system, then we can see the implications of that on the overall excretion and efficiency. So animals started at initial weight of 49 kilos on the grass silage, 90 kilos on the cereal. And the final weight was 552 for grass silage and 440 for cereal beef. So the feeding period was much less for cereal beef production. It was reduced from 456 days to 270 days. And that has important implications because with fewer days of feeding, then there'll be fewer maintenance requirements of the animals and therefore there will be less nitrogen required and less nitrogen excreted. And this is shown by the total feed dry matter consumed, which was less than half on the cereal beef production system compared with the grass silage system. The nitrogen content of the diets was just slightly less for the cereal beef at 22.4 grams per kilo of dry matter compared with 24 for the grass silage. So the feed nitrogen consumed in kilograms per animal was 83.6 for grass silage diets, 37.3 for the cereal diets. The total live weight gain over the whole of the, the fattening period was 503 kilos on the grass silage system, 348 on cereal beef. And the life weight gain per day increased from 1.1 on grass silage to 1.3 on cereal, as we'd expect with the, the better quality diets. It's assumed that the nitrogen content of life weight gain was the same on both systems. So the nitrogen contained in life weight gain was 13.6 kilos on the grass silage diet and 9.4 on the cereal leaf system. The nitrogen excretion can be calculated by difference and the total per animal was 70 kilos for the grass silage system, 28 kilos for the cereal leaf system. 
because the more rapid growth rates of the cereal beef system then animals are actually in the system for less than a year so we can adjust nitrogen excretion to kilograms per animal place per year and that's 56 kilos for grass silage systems 38 kilos for cereal beef systems if we look at nitrogen excretion as kilograms per kilogram of live weight gain then it's 0.14 for the grass silage systems and 0.08 for the cereal beef system. So the overall nitrogen efficiency, which is nitrogen output in meat divided by nitrogen input in the diet, it's 17% for a grass silage based system, 25% for a cereal beef production system. So the differences in systems are due to a number of factors due to live weight of the animals, live weight gain of the animals, the feeding period over which they're, they're kept, the dietary nitrogen content and the dietary carbohydrate content. Now we can summarize and draw some conclusions. So the first thing is that diets formulated with minimum excess protein will reduce nitrogen excretion and increase nitrogen efficiency. So we should all, always try and formulate diets where we can meet the protein requirements as closely as possible. Remember that the animal requires metabolizable protein and the rumen requires rumen degradable protein. So we need to balance these for the rumen supplies. At the whole animal level, we need to balance microbial crude protein production and digestible undegraded protein supplies so as to improve the efficiency of the animal. In the rumen, we need to balance rumen degradable protein supply with fermentable carbohydrate supply to reduce excess nitrogen. Milk urea nitrogen is a good indicator of nitrogen adequacy particularly of adequacy of rumen degradable protein and fermentable carbohydrate balance. Milk protein yield divided by protein intake in indicates efficiency of nitrogen utilization. Efficiency increases with production level, both in beef and in dairy cows, because we're diluting the maintenance compared with the actual production of milk or meat. And finally, high crude protein diets can reduce fertility in dairy cows.